So I'm going to go through the top 10 reasons for Bitcoin 100,000. And hopefully everybody can, can see the screen a little, tell them what you're going to tell them. Here are the top 10 reasons. Um, but I'm going to start with this. It's never too late to invest in Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is basically, I'm just going to continue letting people in as they come in here. Stop screen share, go back. Bitcoin to me, it's been fascinating as I watch the industry come in, more and more of the quote big guys, the institution people are all excited about Bitcoin. And you watch Michael Saylor and Anthony Scaramucci. And I, my joke is trying to figure out Bitcoin is like trying to figure out email in the 90s and you miss the internet. Right, because everybody's like, they're all, oh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin to me is is it's me personally. It's like gold. You buy a, a brick of gold for five hundred thousand dollars. You buy a, a unit of Bitcoin for fifty thousand. The market cap for gold is ten trillion. The market cap for Bitcoin is one trillion. So, if Bitcoin were to go up, basically, the market will continue to push the price up, and that's what I talk about. When I, when I go with Bitcoin here, Bitcoin number one, well, our sharing is slow motion. Here we go. It's never too late to invest in Bitcoin. And that's kind of what I talk about is, is I think the market's going to keep going up. People are like, oh, it's 50,000, it's 60,000. Well, the market of Bitcoin at 1 trillion has the opportunity, if it grew to compete with gold at 10 trillion, a $50,000 Bitcoin unit could go to 500,000 because a brick of gold right now is actually at about $500,000. So a lot of times you go, oh, did I miss it? Is it too late? No, it's not too late, but Bitcoin is just one small component. And where that leads me to is, is again, a lot of this is education. Some of you guys will laugh, like Anna Mikey will laugh at this because she's been in so long. But I tell people, don't look at the price, look at the percentage. And what I mean by that is a brick of gold is $500,000. Most people can't buy it, but you might be able to buy a $200 gold inglet, a little you know, gold coin that gold coin goes up and down by the same percentage as the brick of gold. And that's interesting. I just had a meeting earlier and a friend of mine is like, oh, you know, Bitcoin dropped $4,000. I'm like, well, Bitcoin was at 20,000 in December. It's basically at 50 or 60. That's 300%, you know, or 200. But when a Bitcoin unit drops from 60,000 to 55,000, that looks like a big drop. But as a percentage, it's not any bigger than when Apple might go from 1,200 to 1,000. So we get caught up because the numbers look big when it goes up or down. But as a percentage, you have to say, if I were to invest in something, what kind of percentage rate of return am I looking for? And that's where that's where Bitcoin, again, to me, was always fascinating is the price isn't really relevant. If you think it can go from 50,000 to 500,000, those percentages are what is going to move the market. So as more people come in and get educated, price becomes irrelevant because, again, like a brick of gold, you don't need to buy a $500,000 brick. You can buy a $250 inlet. You don't need to buy $60,000 unit of Bitcoin. You can actually buy $50, $60. You can buy smaller percentages for whatever it is you're looking to do. And that's where I think people get a little confused is they're always looking at the price saying, did I miss it? You didn't miss it if you're looking at what the percentage is of what it's going to go up. So I'm going to switch to three. This is, we're trying to use Zoom here, guys. And I've got my video running in the background, which is, I don't know if it's annoying you guys. It's annoying me. So I'm going to switch to static backdrop, less confusing, back to share screen. And 
we're in. So that was number two. Here's number three. Basically, if it'll switch. Come on, guys. Everybody still see number two. Lauren, do you see screen two? That's all I see. Screen two. There's screen three. Here we go. Bitcoin will not be, in my opinion, will not be a global currency. A lot of people call this new space cryptocurrency. They think, oh, is it going to be a currency? Is it going to be payment? Again, I like to do what I call retrospective evolution. What worked in the past and how do we evolve it in the future? Let's go back again to gold. Is gold a currency? Well, it depends on how you define Currency, you can buy a brick of gold. And, and I joke with people all the time. People go, oh, Bitcoin doesn't do anything. Bitcoin doesn't act like a currency. Well, neither does gold, but gold can be used as a form of payment. If you have gold, you can actually convert it back to cash and use cash, or you might be able to run around with a gold coin and convince somebody to take that gold coin. Gold does act as a method of payment, but it's not necessarily functioning as a true currency. And that's where I draw the distinction. Bitcoin to me isn't really a currency. It's a store of value that can also be used as a type of payment. And I may be able to send it to you. The challenge with, with gold is it's not very portable. Most of us don't run around with a gold coin in our pocket. And I love when people say, well, Bitcoin doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't make anything. And I look at them, I say, how many employees does gold have? Last time I checked, gold doesn't have any employees. Gold doesn't have a PL or an EBITDA. Or, gold is a, is a unit and a store of value. So to me, Bitcoin is sort of this cool store of value that goes up and down in a percentage, but it won't be a currency. And then we hear a lot, again, I'm trying to help with sort of what we hear in the industry. People go, oh, well, well, banks are going to use Bitcoin as payment and there's going to be payment units above among banks. There's not. And, and I don't mean it pejoratively that I don't think blockchain and crypto and stable coins that we'll talk about don't have value, but Bitcoin can't be a unit of payment for banks because it's too volatile. If you were to send, you know, $2 or $3, it doesn't matter. If you sent somebody $3,000 or $30,000 or $3 million, that fluctuation, I could send Adam $3,000 and by the time it gets there, it could go up or down by a few percentages. So banks can't have volatility as a payment mechanism. It just doesn't work. And so the term you'll hear is what are called stable coins. And a stable coin, it acts exactly as the word connotates. It's stable, it equals a dollar. So if I send somebody like Lauren a dollar, it's equal to a dollar. The original dollar that was created digitally was called Tether. And Tether was just basically, it's gonna equal a dollar. And, and Brock and a bunch of the guys that Adam and I were you know, friends with in the group created that aspect. But the stable coins that are coming out, and Anna Mikey, we'll have to catch up at some point because I know you were doing a lot with graphene and some of these other blockchains. I'll, I'd be curious. But here's the way, in my opinion, banks are going to work. If I have money in a Wells Fargo account and I want to wire transfer money to somebody, anybody that's ever wired transfer money, like if I need to send money to Chris Wise or Glenn Devitt, I have to go to the bank fill out wire transfer paperwork, pay twenty-five dollars or $30,000 for the privilege of sending my money to Glenn. It'll get to Glenn if I hit the cutoff by two o'clock. If I don't, it won't get there in a day. But if I hit that cutoff, it might make it there tomorrow or the next day. Glenn has to go to his bank, pay money for the privilege of getting cash out. That's fascinating because cash, the actual physical dollars don't move through the bank network, but it's still legacy technology. It's called SWIFT, Fedwire, ACH. The way wire transfers work is the bank's sitting on my money and they're making interest. 
And if I wire transfer it, it moves to a different part through the network and everybody sits on that quote cash. The cash is really just digital. But the way the legacy networks work is everybody's making little bits of interest on that money while it moves through. If I wanted to email somebody a stable coin, whether it's Tether, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's EOS, it could be any of them. I don't need anybody's permission. I can email Lauren $10,000 and she'll have it in 15 or 20 minutes through the network, very little fees. So in my opinion, this is how banks are going to work is if I have cash in Wells Fargo and I want to send money, I'm going to convert. I call it a down convert. I'm going to convert down to a Wells Fargo token, a WFT. That Wells Fargo token will run on Ripple, which is a type of blockchain. I'll email it to Glenn at Chase. It'll hit his Chase account, convert to a JP Morgan token. Again, they're both equal to a dollar. JP Morgan might be running on Graphene or Stellar, but that token in JP Morgan now that equals a dollar will convert up into my account for cash if I need it. So banks are going to use digital settlement. That's really what Ripple is, Ripple technology, not the token. The technology is a way to use digital settlement to move money versus legacy settlement. And again, it's to me, it's fascinating because the wire transfer is still just digital, but the way it moves through the money network is really different. So Bitcoin can't, in my opinion, ever be a payment mechanism, but blockchain will enable digital settlement to occur in much more fascinating ways. We won't need the bank's permission to move money around, but we still may use, you know, currency within the bank network. Bitcoin maximalists, I can't see everybody's screen, but anybody that's seen or heard of this, is is anybody hear the term Bitcoin maximalists? Few people. What that means, I'm fascinated by it again because I'm in the world of this sort of institutional hedge fund, you know, the Michael Saylors of the world who are putting money in, they're all excited about Bitcoin and Anthony Scaramucci. And their question used to always be, are you a Bitcoin maximalist? And what they define that as is Bitcoin is the winner against all of the other cryptocurrencies. And there's a couple thousand of them. And they're like, oh, well, Bitcoin's the winner. Bitcoin maximalist means Bitcoin's the winner of the cryptocurrency war against all of the other currencies. That that makes no sense. Again, that's like saying gold is the winner versus silver or copper, or even worse, gold is the winner versus Apple stock or Amazon stock or General Motors. They're not competing. To think Bitcoin is the global winner that conquered all it is such a weird fallacy of the investment institutions. There is no winner. Like, In the stock market, there is no winner in the stock market. There is no one stock that won. There's a lot of different ones. And so the cryptocurrencies, to me, and I'll get into what I think they are, they have different functions. Bitcoin isn't necessarily competing against other tokens. Bitcoin's got its own use case. And so I don't think there's such thing as a Bitcoin maximalist because they're not competing to try and win. Number six, blockchain, Bitcoin, and crypto are different. And people ask me now, are you a blockchain company? And I look at them and I say, there's no such thing. And, you know, again, people twitch when you're antagonistic or it's not confrontational. Saying you're a blockchain company, in my opinion, is like saying you're an internet company because you use a website. The fact that you use a website Does it make you an internet company? Anybody that's old enough to remember like me, I'm old. Back when the internet started, there was internet world. And you would go to a conference called internet world of people who were internet companies. Internet world doesn't exist because there's no such thing as an internet company. And and back in the day, Sears became Sears.com and they were an internet company. No, they were a retailer that had a website. 
And so that's what happens a lot of times is, and again, we're guilty of it. We called ourselves a blockchain company because that's what the market was calling things. So when you play into the hype, you use whatever terminology is there. It's like the old movie. Again, some of these things are age specific. My, my audience luckily is old enough that most of us would have seen the movie Ghostbusters. And there's a great scene at the end of Ghostbusters. Anybody that's seen it may not remember, but at the end, the, the Ghostbusters are on top of a building and there's this little minx girl in a leotard looking down at the Ghostbusters and says, are you a god? The Ghostbusters look at each other and say, no. And she says, then die. And lightning comes out of her fingers and, you know, the Ghostbusters are hiding and rocks are flying. And when the lightning stops, one Ghostbuster looks at the other and says, hey, if somebody asks if you're a god, you say yes. And what I mean by that is people will go, oh, are you a blockchain company? Well, yeah, if you're going to give me money, I'm a blockchain company. I'm fintech. I'm B2B. So this concept of blockchain to me is the underlying technology that drives different industries. You're not an internet company, even though you might be running an ATM network. You might be a real estate company offering virtual reality, but that's using the internet. Blockchain is the technology that's going to change a lot of industries. And so when I talk about blockchain, I tell people, look at your industry, whatever your industry is, and look at how the internet disrupted or displaced processes. If you can figure out how the internet disrupted processes or displaced them, then you can figure out the blockchain might do the same thing better, more efficiently. But blockchain's the technology. Bitcoin is a tradable asset that runs on blockchain as the technology. And cryptocurrencies to me, to me personally, cryptocurrencies are glorified penny stocks. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The cryptocurrencies are tokens that are a tradable asset. Now, in blockchain, going back again, that's why I love Anna, Mike, and some of these on here. There's different underlying, quote, blockchains, graphene, Ethereum. There's different types of technology. That's the, the most simple way to say it. It's like they're saying different kinds of databases. There used to be Microsoft SQL had a database. Oracle had a database. Oracle's database is better than Microsoft's, but those two databases both exist. They do functions and they perform something different, but they're databases blockchain technology, but there's different types of blockchains that do different functions. So again, anybody says, are you a blockchain company? Well, it depends on what you're using it for, but they are different. The technology, Bitcoin, crypto to me is the tradable asset. And so again, when I talk about it, the reason I spend time on this, one unit of Bitcoin to me is like one unit of gold. A brick of gold's $500,000, a gold coin's 50. A, a unit of Bitcoin's 50,000, you can buy $50 worth. The reason that becomes important is there's two competing factions to buy Bitcoin. Within the market, you've got retailers, you, what are called retail customers, consumers. Most consumers, 99% of the world's population doesn't have access to financial instruments. They're not going out and buying gold. They don't have access to, you know, stocks and bonds and things like that. The technology of mobile phones and computers enables a whole different generation, a, a global consumer to buy a financial instrument like Bitcoin that goes up and down as the same percentage as the guy that can buy a whole unit. So the guy that might only be able to afford $500, but that percentage is just as important as to the guy that can buy 500 million. And usually the financial world has discriminated against the retail investors because they buy small quantities, they can't get in. Bitcoin to me is the great equalizer. So you have more and more retail people coming on, more and more wallets coming on, more and more people that are able to buy this asset. And now over here, you have institutions. And institutions are starting to come in and buy Bitcoin as well. 
they almost have to. If you look at, again, number two, the percentage of return, you have to, if you have a portfolio of stocks and bonds and, and high tech and growth and international, to not have a percentage of your portfolio in Bitcoin as an asset unit is almost irresponsible. And so there's a, a, a phrase out there called stock to flow. And I'm not going to get technical, but I want you guys to, to know some of the terms. Stock to flow is this model of evaluating how much money is going to go into Bitcoin to move it up or down. That's as simple as you can make it. I created a term I call bond to flow, B2F. If the big companies move 1% to 3% of their bond or cash portfolio into Bitcoin, the amount of purchasing is going to go up. And we've seen that recently. We've seen that with um, Michael Saylor. We've seen it with Anthony Scaramucci. We've seen it with Elon Musk, where he moved a percentage. He moved a billion dollars, which sounds like a lot, but in perspective of Tesla, it was a percentage of his actual assets or holdings. So as these bigger companies start to move more assets in, the way Bitcoin goes up or down is just almost like stock. It's supply and demand. As you, as you have more and more demand and a limited supply, that is going to drive the price up. And you have a concept called HODL, H-O-D-L, hold on for dear life. More and more of the people that have bought Bitcoin are holding it because they believe it's going to go up. They believe there's going to be more attrition in the asset of it of appreciating. So you have less people selling, more people buying, price is going to invariably go up. A lot of it's simple mathematics. This one I said earlier, Bitcoin to me is like figuring out email in the 90s and missing the internet. And the reason I say that, again, some of this is meant to be simple, some's a little more complicated, but I like to do simple explanations. Think of gold for a moment. The market cap for gold is $10 trillion. Over here, you have the US stock market. And the stock market's market cap, I think in the US is, don't quote me, it's either 38 trillion or 98 trillion. It's something like that. But Within the stock market, you have a much bigger market cap. And the way stocks work is companies issue stock to raise money and people trade the stocks to make money. That's my distinction. <clears throat> Bitcoin as a unit of gold is great. It's a cool investment. I think it'll go up. It's a great long-term value. But decentralized finance, basically these exchanges where tokens are traded, is like the stock market. The perspective between gold and the stock market is like email in the 90s versus everything else, <clears throat> versus the internet. So while the institution people are finally all excited about <clears throat> Bitcoin, I don't think that's the game changer. The game changer to me is decentralized finance where companies are going to use tokens as a way to raise money versus traditional stock markets. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. We're almost wrapping up. We're going to keep everything on time and then have some cool introductions. Um, some people, again, if you know this, great. If not, <clears throat> I sort of like sharing. In the United States, primarily, there are different levels of, of a stock market. There's the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange. And that's the big boys. To get on the New York Stock Exchange, you primarily, again, within reason, you're usually seven to 10 years in a company, a hundred million or more in revenue. You're a big company. You go public. You use the stock market to raise money, but the volatility is lower. <clears throat> the volume is higher and the appreciation may go up, but it may go up one, two, three times. For, for an Amazon stock to go from 3,000 to 6,000 to double is a big lift. It can be done, but the movement is slower, but the volatility and risk in the New York Stock Exchange is, is historically lower. Underneath that's what's called the NASDAQ. A lot of tech companies, 
more appreciation, more volatility, but still not as risky. Under that is the OTC, the over-the-counter, also called micro caps, which is the polite term. The pejorative term are called pink sheets or penny stocks. And people are like, oh, you know, penny stocks, those are risky, those are scams. Well, penny stocks are risky. The volatility can be very high. People buy penny stocks. You buy something on the OTC at 10 cents, hoping it goes to a dollar. You don't buy it because you think you get equity. And again, this is where people either don't understand or aren't honest with themselves because the institution guys are all like, well, investing is about equity. Yes and no. If I invest in a 10 cent penny stock that I think is going to discover gold in Australia, if it goes up to a dollar because they find gold, I'm excited. If it goes under and, and fails, the fact that I own that stock in equity, I don't get a dividend or a distribution out of that because in the smaller companies, if they go under, even though you own equity, you really usually don't get anything back. So this lower level of pink sheets is what they're called. A pink sheet company is what's called unaudited. It means they don't have a lot of financials, but they're, they're startups, they're risky. And you can buy a pink sheet company at five cents, eight, 10, 10 cents, and it might move up and it's at 30. And crypto tokens to me are like glorified penny stocks. There's a great one that went out called a Wazex, Steve Wozniak. And they played the perfect penny stock game. And I love Ken and, and E-Force. So the company's called E-Force, E-F-F-O-R-C-E. -E, any of you can look it up. And it supposedly is carbon this or capture that. And if it does certain kinds of carbon, you earn it and the token goes up. No, when you look at it, Steve Wozniak's name was attached. The token went from 10 cents to three and a half dollars. Why? Wozniak's name was attached. We actually looked at all the press releases, all the, the searches. Less than 3% of the searches were on E-Force, the actual company. Most of them were on Wozniak. That means the name drove the publicity in the market to move that token up. Now, hopefully the company will be successful. They'll raise money. But those risk tokens, there's another great one. I love Alex Mashinsky and Celsius. Celsius is a great company. You can actually put Bitcoin with Celsius and then take loans out against it. So you don't have to sell your Bitcoin. And Michael Saylor again said that the other day. We've been saying it for a while. Hopefully you never have to sell Bitcoin. If you own it, should never have to sell it. If you can loan and borrow money against it and always hold that asset, there's a fascinating appreciation. But Celsius went from a penny to over $5. The percentage of return is tremendous. It's bigger than Bitcoin. Bitcoin went 20,000 to 60,000. That's great. Doge, the little Doge coin that people are trading. Those crypto tokens have a higher percentage of return, but a much higher risk profile. So again, to me, they're not cryptocurrencies. They're not designed to be currencies. They're glorified tradable tokens. They're penny stocks. You buy it at 10 cents. Hope you sell it at a dollar. And that was the last thing I, I was going to say is, is most of the crypto tokens aren't safe. People like, oh, they're risky. True. So is, a, is, a, is an OTC. A micro cap stock is risky. Stocks on the NASDAQ are less risky. Stocks on the New York Stock Exchange are even less risky. But the profile of return, the percentage is different. And I have people ask me, they're like, oh, should I invest in, in Bitcoin? My answer is, it depends. What's your risk profile and what's your horizon, your time frame? If, if it's long term, I think if you buy Bitcoin and hold it for three, five, 10 years, it's a great long term asset. If you want a higher risk profile, you want a little more volatility, a little more return, there's a bunch of tokens out there that might do two, three, four, five hundred percent, but they might go to zero. So again, risk profile to me is really critical. Crypto is, 
is like that. So for Bitcoin to go to 100,000, which was kind of what I was looking at a lot of this stuff is there's more and more education of things that need to happen for people to understand where the market's going, what's going to happen within the industry, what we can do to sort of drive everything forward. Hopefully that helps. Again, super quick, super easy. I have a ton of information out on uh, the bullseye guy. I do a bunch of these things called short casts, a little three to five minute segments around that. So.